Good morning folks, welcome back to Higher Chemistry. As you can see, today we're looking at equilibrium, um, which doesn't occupy very much of the SQA pages, but the ideas behind it are quite tricky and are a frequent flyer pretty much every year in some degree or another, sometimes even in the open ender. So I'd like to have a look at the concepts behind equilibrium and I'd also have to look, I'd like to look at how to change the balance of any given equilibrium. I'm going to fire the, my frequently flown example of equilibria. You're really going to hate me for this, or you're going to hate this equation, or both, by the time we're done, but it's so useful for basically all of the points here. The Haber process, Haber process? I'm not sure the correct German pronunciation of that terrible person's name. Um, but the Haber process looks like this. Uh, I think we'll start with the concepts behind equilibrium and we'll come back to how to change the also what the balance is for an equilibrium and how to change that balance point. So here's our reaction vessel containing nitrogen and hydrogen. We're trying to make ammonia and we've put, we've put these gases into the box and we've clicked go on the reaction. And what happens now? Well, if we were to plot a, a very quick primer from N5, in case you've forgotten, of course, the double arrow indicates that this reaction can proceed in both directions simultaneously. So some nitrogen and hydrogen are joining to make ammonia, and at the same time, some ammonia is falling apart to make nitrogen and hydrogen. But if we were to plot concentration against time, um, you would find something like this. Let's do the nitrogen and hydrogen in purple, and let's do the ammonia concentration in this nice pink colour. So, if the concentration goes from 0 to 100%, then at the start, obviously, in your box, you've only got nitrogen and hydrogen. So, therefore, we start with that, 100% of this stuff. As these two start to react together to form this, then their concentrations will drop over time, and you'll get a curve that looks something like this. By the same token, um, there is zero ammonia at the start, but over time the concentration of it will rise, and if I do my drawing correctly, you should get something like that. Now if I've done this correctly, you will notice that both of these lines flatten off at approximately the same time-ish. Now, a couple of questions here. Why do they flatten off? Um, and what is this? what happens during this time period? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to plot a second graph, and we can compare it to this graph. I'm an idiot, of course. I should have plotted both of them in the same piece of paper. I might just do that. Okay, this is where I'm meant to be at this point in time. My apologies. So here's my concentration against time. Rate against time. I'm going to do in two different colours, the same two colours, appropriately enough, the forward, what I've called the forward reaction, which is left to right, I'm going to do in purple. Uh, and it is going to start very fast, of course, because there's tonnes of these around, and it's going to fade off and eventually flatten off, because as, this, uh, as the concentration of these two decreases, the forward reaction speed decreases. And I'm hoping you can maybe jump in and figure out what the backward one is going to look like. Only there is something special about the backwards and forward rates that doesn't happen here. So the backward rate is going to start at zero because there isn't any ammonia. And it's going to rise up and it's going to... That's supposed to be a curve. I do apologise. Ah. So that's where the backward ends up. So these two reaction rates end up becoming equal at about that time there. And oh look, what else happens about that time there? <coughs> I do beg your pardon. Sorry about that, dodgy voice first thing in the morning. Um, so yeah, as you can see, the time it takes for the concentrations to no longer change doesn't, it's not a coincidence, of course that's what happens. Because at this point here in time, the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the backward reaction that means these two are no longer changing their concentrations, and this isn't changing its concentration. Please note that the reaction is still running at this point. So the reaction continues to go forwards and backwards, it's just that the rates are identical. And you know what? That is when the reaction has reached equilibrium. When the forward and backward reactions have equal rates. Equilibrium. 
and this results in a no longer changing concentration of your reactants and your products. I say reactants and products, but you know what? Here's an interesting thing. Um, it doesn't actually matter whether you started as we did with 100% of this or 100% of this. If you seal a box up with only pure ammonia and you cook it to the same temperature and conditions that you started with this box of just nitrogen and hydrogen, you would end up <coughs> with this happening. So let's redraw this graph here. And this time the concentration of ammonia starts off sky high and the concentration of nitrogen and hydrogen starts at zero. But provided you keep the same conditions, this is what would happen. Try and get these levels correct. As in, that's the same concentration as that, and that's the same concentration as that. You would still end up with your box containing. Now, I've roughly sketched out here, and I'm hoping it's about 70% and say 30%. Probably isn't, but you get my point. There is much more of this mixture around than there is of the ammonia. And that is the balance of the, what I refer to as the balance of the equilibrium. We say in chemistry that the equilibrium lies to one side or the other, and as you can hopefully see, this, uh, this equilibrium definitely lies to the left-hand side. So that's the phrase the SQA uses, lies to the left. That's what I refer to as the balance point. If you come back for advanced higher, we'll hit you with a bit more explanation as you can actually put a number on this instead of just saying, oh, it lies to the left. Um, but for the moment, that's good enough for us. Uh, so, yeah, a couple, of, a couple of concepts there, guys. Equilibria happen in sealed systems. You notice as I put a closed-up box here, you have to have a closed box, because if your box is not closed, then some of these gases can escape, and you'll never reach the correct balance point. What affects that balance point, I'm just going to come on to in the second half of the video. But in the meantime, please remember that the rate of the forward reaction will start high and then come to a value and the rate of the backward reaction starts at zero and comes to the same value and when these two rates are equal to each other you have reached equilibrium. The concentrations will alter as a result of that and the relative concentration compared to each other that's your balance point of your equilibrium. This is referred to as a dynamic equilibrium because uh, it's drunk too much coffee. No, it's referred to as a dynamic equilibrium because the reactions are still going, even though outside, from the outside world, it looks like the reaction stopped. If you imagine our sealed box here, if we had like a gauge on the side here that shows, let's imagine we've got one gauge here that shows uh, nitrogen and hydrogen, N2H2, and we've got another gauge attached to the same box that shows the ammonia level, then this would start off reading uh, 100, of course, and this would start off reading at uh, zero. And as you click go on the reaction, this would slowly tick up one and then two and then three. And this, of course, would drop down 99. And you'd reach a point where eventually this seemed to be stuck at 70. And this seems to be stuck at 30. I'm just picking these numbers randomly, by the way. You'll see why uh, in, in the rest of the video. And the reaction looks like it stopped. But my point is it most definitely hasn't stopped. It's just that you're going nowhere. It's like walking down the up escalator at the same speed as the escalator's going, which I would love to take a class of people to the Eastgate Centre. If you're not a local to Inverness, that's our local shopping centre. I'd love to take an entire class there and get them to walk down the up escalator at the same speed as the escalator's going. Because from their point of view on the escalator, then they'll be walking down and the escalator's moving up. So you can see the reaction still happening. But if you were standing watching all these people on the escalator from the other side, then all you'd see is a row of heads not going anywhere, apparently. I think the security guards might not let me do that demonstration. Boo. Okay, let's move on to the second half of the video. Making more money. Um, that's what we want to do because at the moment we are in this distinctly feeble position of still having 70% of your reactant gases and only making 30% of your product. We're assuming we're running an ammonia factory here rather than a nitrogen and hydrogen factory. There's not much profit in that because that's quite common. This is difficult to get a hold of and feeds currently um, the planet basically. 
Uh, if you're interested, SciShow did a, an, an excellent video on just what a complicated and uh, hideous human being Fritz Haber was. I'll put a link in the doobly-doo um, somewhere up here. Go and watch it when you've got 10 minutes. It's very entertaining and shocking as well. So, um, <clears throat> making more profit, that's what we want to do, guys. There are three ways to change this balance. By the way, if you come back for advanced hire, you'll realize that only one of them truly changes the balance, and I'm sorry. But at hire, there are three different ways to do this, and there is one way which doesn't change the balance. Let's start, oddly enough, with the way that does not change the 70-30, but we still use it anyway. I wonder why. And the answer to that is a catalyst. So if you have a catalyst, then what you do is you speed up reactions, of course. We all know that catalysts speed up reactions. <coughs> so the question is, why doesn't this catalyst speed up um, our reaction and give us more ammonia? And the answer, if you think about it, is quite obvious. So there's a catalyst. Um, because if you speed up this reaction faster, the catalyst doesn't know that you're only supposed to speed up this one, and it speeds up this one too. Which means you still have exactly the same balance. You haven't changed it one bit. What you do do is you get there faster, and that's why they're used in industry. Can I draw just one more time? You'll be glad to know. Concentration versus time. Uh, and what we, if we stick the same two colours as we had before, let's say this is the version without the catalyst. <coughs> And we've got our 70-30 balance. That's not quite 70, sorry. Don't throw fruit at me. Here's what happens with the catalyst. You still get 70-30, but you do get there a heck of a lot quicker because that's the time to reach equilibrium with a catalyst and that's the time to reach equilibrium without a catalyst. And time is money, of course, in industry. Uh, so, yeah, that's why they actually throw the iron catalyst into the Haber process. It doesn't change the balance, but it gets you to the equilibrium balance faster. So let's look at the three ways that you can change this balance. Method the first. Right, you can change the pressure if you're dealing with a gas. Oops, sorry, I'm swearing. If the reactants or products, which, by the way, doesn't really make sense uh, anymore, but we'll still call these reactants and we'll still call that products. Um, so... If the reactants or products are a gas, changing the pressure can change your balance. And here is why. On this side of the reaction, there is a total of four moles of gas. You notice I've actually put state symbols in for a change. I am so sloppy. I never put these in. You need to get yourself a better YouTube tutor. So there are four moles of gas on this side, and there are two moles of gas on this side. Now, if you have a think about it for a second... If you were to crush these guys, this entire mixture down into a smaller space, then these are more likely to collide with each other than these are, simply because there are more of them, and they're now closer together. Which means, oh look, you're going to speed up this reaction here more than this reaction here, because you're dealing with four moles of gas. So this will now become faster. So what? Well, your balance now might be down to, say, 60, <coughs> 40. I do apologise for clearing my throat in your ear all the time. Sorry about that, guys. So, if you increase the pressure, I should have said that somewhere on the page. So, faster, higher pressure. Please note that it's not always the forward reaction, of course. It's a forward reaction in this case, because there are four moles of gas on this side. They will collide more frequently than the two moles of gas at a higher pressure. So the reaction balance will shift that way. If there happen to be more moles of gas on this side, you can turn the pressure up. It will go this way. So there's no absolutes. It will always go to one side or the other. It will always go... Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the variable. I'm going to explain why it works in terms of rates, because that's what the SQ wants recently, they changed that a couple of years back, they want you to know why they work, it's actually a good idea. Uh, and lastly, down here I'll put a simple version of the rule for you to remember. So here's my written summary guys, if you increase the pressure, the equilibrium moves to the side with the fewest moles of gas, or you could have it moving it away 
from the side with the most moles of gas. Either of these are, are true, both of these are true. You notice I haven't said what happens if you decrease the pressure, because I'll leave you to memorise personally. I think just memorising one version of these three rules is enough, and then you can flip it if the situation demands it. So that means decreasing pressure, the equilibrium would move to the side with the most moles of gas. So if you drop the pressure, it would move towards this side. By the way, just a little bit of real-world relevance, that is why uh, this reaction runs at 300 times atmospheric pressure. That's Your bike tyre has somewhere between 6 and 8 times atmospheric pressure. Um, so this is seriously squashed. Why don't they use 3,000 atmospheric pressures then? and shift it really this way? The answer at that point, of course, is because your pipes and your machinery cost more than the ammonia you would make. So like most things in life, it's a compromise. Method the second. Add or remove a chemical from this equilibrium mixture. <clears throat> Please remember, we're talking about a sealed system here, it's a closed system. So all of these chemicals are involved, say, in a closed box. So when you say add or remove a chemical, you're not just taking it from one side, it's the entire mixture here. They all exist all at once. Now, if we were to add a chemical to this mixture, if we were to add, for example, ah, I don't know, some more hydrogen ions. So if we were to throw in some extra hydrogen ions in the form of, say, hydrochloric, ah, and not a good example, because there's a chlorine going on in SOR. Let's say nitric acid. So if we were to add a splash of nitric acid, we don't really care about that as a spectator. If you were to add a splash of nitric acid, you'd be adding hydrogen ions to this. Now, I'm hoping you can see that hydrogen ions are involved in a collision with these things here. I've just made this equilibrium up, by the way. Don't shout to me, other chemistry people. I know it's not correct, but it's good enough for what we're doing here. Um, these are colliding with these in order to make chlorine gas and three lots of water. That's actually six lots of water. I can't balance my own equations, silly old fool. Sorry about that. Let's ignore that for a second. It's the fact that it's out of balance is not relevant. What is relevant is the fact that if we add hydrogen ions, we are going to cause this to collide more often, which will accelerate this reaction here. This will become faster, which means you will produce more of these guys. We'll shift the balance to the right because we're adding a chemical to the left. The opposite would also apply, of course. If we were to somehow remove some of the chlorines, for example, if you just take that as an example, remove some of the chlorines, then they are able to collide with the water less often, and this reaction here would become slower, and this one would just continue at its previous rate, you would still end up moving over towards this side. So here's the summary statement. So if you add a chemical to a given equilibrium, the chemical, you'll see the chemical on one side or the other, so if you add to one side, the equilibrium will move its balance to the opposite side from where you added. So if I added more chlorine gas, this one here would become faster and I'll create more of these two, which is a wee bit counterintuitive. Adding more at this side produces more of this side, but it's because you accelerate that rate of reaction there. The opposite will also apply. If I were to pluck out a chemical, if I were to remove this chemical here, this will collide less often, so this reaction here would become slower. This one here just continues at its normal rate, and we would move to the side that I actually removed the chemical from. So if I remove some of this, these ions here, then I will cr this, this balance, this percentage here, will actually drop because I'll shift back over to this side. This used to be known as Le Chatelier's principle, but we're not going to go into that as historical chemistry. I'll tell you what I'm going to go into, though. I'm going to go into the two methods that I've seen the SQA use. How the heck do you remove a chemical from an equilibrium? What, reach in with a pair of tweezers and pluck it out? There are two ways of removing uh, a specific chemical. And we'll do it with this one first. Um, you can actually remove these hydrogen ions by adding an acid or a base as appropriate. Now, what I mean by as appropriate? You notice that there are acidic ions involved in this equilibrium, which means if you were to add a base to this equilibrium, for example, sodium hydroxide here, 
Sodium hydroxide has, seems to have absolutely no connection with any of these reactants, but this will team up with that and form water. And that will rip your hydrogen ions right out of this equilibrium. That reaction there will stop almost stone dead. This one here will continue and you'll shift the balance over to this side. So strangely, adding a chemical which doesn't seem to be connected with any of these is because there's hydrogen ions, acidic ions involved. If you add a base, they will get removed. The opposite would also apply. If you had OH ions in an equilibrium, you could add an acid. The hydrogen in that case would kidnap the OH out of the equilibrium and then same result. The second method <clears throat> involves precipitation. Now, this frequently co crops up with ions, silver plus ions, for example, are such a common one. If you have silver ions, AQ, in an equilibrium, then one of the things you can add to that equilibrium is sodium chloride. <laughs> Again, why? Because silver ions, uh, if you look up the solubility table in your data book, I forget what page it is, there's a table of solubilities in your data book, um, and you'll find silver ions are almost always insoluble, with one exception, silver nitrate. So silver is often involved with nitrate and equilibria, and fine, yeah, it stays nice and dissolved until you add something, almost anything else, a, a counter ion, teams up with the silver and forms silver chloride solid. And as soon as you've done that, that can no longer take part in an aqueous equilibrium, and effectively you've removed these ions. So precipitating ions out and adding the complementary acid or base, whichever one is involved in the equilibrium, you add the other one. Those are the two methods of actually chemically removing things from an equilibrium. Method the third, and the last, in fact. Change the temperature. We've got back to good old Haber again. Uh, and I've got this from ChemGuide. It's a good website, by the way. If you're looking for a nice chemistry revision website, ChemGuide is good. Uh, right up to and including advanced hire. And he or she, whoever runs the site, says that the delta H is negative 92. Now, we have two delta H's. So which one is this referring to? Because one of these will be negative 92, and one of them, the opposite one, will be positive 92. And convention says that the one that they give you is for left to right. In other words, the forward reaction. So that is negative 92 kilojoules per mole, and this is positive 92 kilojoules per mole. And I'm an idiot because I should have used different colours to represent endo and exothermic. But you know me, I can't even keep the same notation twice within the one example. <clears throat> so what? Well, if you think about what's going on here, this reaction from left to right is trying to give out energy, heat energy, and this reaction from right to left is taking in heat energy. So... I'm hoping you could work out that if you increase the temperature, you are going to accelerate the endothermic reaction. So the endo moves faster. And if you don't know your endo from your exo, I'll try and put a link up here somewhere to my uh, entropy change videos. Go and learn the stuff. Um, in this case, this is the endothermic reaction, so this one will become faster, and oh look, you've now created less ammonia at higher temperatures. That is why ammonia, the Haber process, runs at only 300 Celsius or so, which is relatively cold compared to industrial processes, apparently. Um, why not just run at room temperature then? Because it would take weeks to get to equilibrium. Like I mentioned with the pressure, it's a compromise. So if you increase the temperature, the endo is faster. Let me write the rule down here below then. So this is possibly the easiest to follow. Maybe I should have started with this one. My apologies. So at higher temperatures, the equilibrium moves to the endothermic side. Whichever side is endothermic, there is no fixed left and right here for this one either. <clears throat> it just depends on the equilibrium uh, case in point. Ah, uh, oh, the bells. The opposite would also apply. If you used a lower temperature, the equilibrium will move to the exothermic side because you're going to slow that reaction down instead. And I think that's us done, as my higher class uh, are just about to come and join me. Um, so that's handy timing.
Was there anything else I needed to add to this? No, I think we're good. Thanks for listening, folks. Um, if this has been useful, you might consider subscribing if you want to the channel. Not that that makes any difference to me, of course, but it makes you happy. Um, <laughs> I hope you like this video. Bye-bye.